love the game. It's my passion, you know? Hits are gonna happen. Big hits are gonna happen. It's, it's part of the game. Unless you're gonna wrap your kids up in bubble wrap, there's not a way to protect them 24-7. You got such an overwhelming desire from these guys to be competitive and be on that grass. The games you'll remember are the ones you have the greatest adversity. I would rather play and get hurt than just not play and never find out if I ever get hurt or not. You get in the NFL and, and there's a saying, you get hurt, you lose your job. An interest and a passion within our staff for making sports safer for our athletes. Protect what matters and encourage people to do that. Football is a game of toughness. Athletes that play the game are wired to epitomize that and play through anything, including concussion, an injury to the brain of the athlete. But who is responsible for limiting the damage of such injuries? There may be too much blaming the victim, but the protocol system currently in place allows no other options, as there is still much to be learned. So a concussion is the result of uh, what's termed a biomechanical impulse that's transmitted to the brain. When that impulse happens and you get that functional disturbance, almost like a traffic jam, right? You're, you're traveling down the road, you're on a four-lane highway, uh, there's an accident, and that blocks that pathway. Get off the exit, we kind of go down you know, the country road, go down to the next exit and get back down. We get to wherever it is we're going, it just takes us a little bit longer. Dr. Stephen Broglio is a certified athletic trainer and came to the University of Michigan in 2011. He is one of the chief researchers for the largest prospective concussion study in history that is currently being executed through funding from the NCAA and the United States Department of Defense. We're running the clinical portion of the, of the investigation at Michigan. I think one of the things, the application that we put in was not just a single site. It wasn't just Michigan. It was a collaborative project across three schools. The other schools teaming up with Michigan to direct the study are the Medical College of Wisconsin, and Indiana University School of Medicine. There are also several member schools involved, including the University of Oklahoma, where Scott Anderson is the principal investigator. He became the head athletic trainer at OU in 1996. Much like the lead universities, OU's medical background promoted its involvement with the project. We participated in NCAA um, sponsored research late 90s, uh, 2000. Those were seminal studies. They uh, prompted some of the uh, standards of, of how we manage concussion today, not, not just at the University of Oklahoma or collegially, but how concussion is managed through the industry of sport. The initial funding is for three years. Uh, we're just now starting to ramp up for year two. It's looking at all the factors in, in terms of baseline testing and then a progression of the study of those things as, as concussion occurs, looking at computerized neuropsych testing and balance testing and, and some of the things that have be, become a standard of concussion management gain a greater appreciation of the validity or lack of validity that some of those tools have. Short-term goals, we want to understand the natural history of concussion. And that means, you know, what are the clinical signs and symptoms and what is uh, the time course that it takes for those things to resolve post-injury? It is looking at every athlete in every sport, whereas again, yeah, it's been a predominant football-focused research and, and that's really been the extent of our research in the past. Many individuals have played football in the sport's history. Only a few play in college, and still fewer make it to the National Football League. Through the decades, concussion protocol has taken a drastically different look. One athlete that made it to the NFL ranks is Steve August. He finished playing at the University of Tulsa in 1977, then was a first round pick of the Seattle Seahawks that same year. Unless you were ding so bad that you came off the field and, pe and you were like talking nonsense, and that's usually when you got attention. Once they straightened up and gave them a good answer and they felt comfortable, they were back in the game. So there was no protocol that if you had some sort of concussion, it was just, you know, you, they wanted you to be able to operate. Down in Scuba, Mississippi, at East Mississippi Community College, Marcus Wood is the offensive coordinator. 
he used to play for the Lions before concluding his collegiate playing career at Georgetown College in Kentucky. Back in those days, if you had an injury, they might hold you out for a day or two, and then you were right back in the mix. I had one that was a, a significant one uh, when I was playing junior college ball where I lost my m memory for a day or two and just didn't recall. I played in a game that I, I couldn't tell you about. Another player turned coach from the same decade is Kendrick Brown. He used to be a wide receiver at the University of North Texas in Denton. These days, you can find Brown roaming the sidelines as the head football coach for Little Elm High School, located about 20 miles east of his alma mater. If there was an incident where someone had a head injury, a player, uh, I do know that that was the tough man syndrome. There wasn't a lot of education out on that. The player, because the coaches would get onto the player, players didn't want to let the coaches or players down, players would get back in there. So that was typical uh, of the 90s. A more recent perspective on the game, not necessarily in the thick of the concussion revelation, comes from Derek Gove. He was a four-year walk-on running back at the University of Oklahoma from 2005 to 2008. Today, he is the vice president of sales for unequal technologies. It wasn't too long ago, however, you know, there, what we know is symptomatic now. There was plenty of guys that likely had them. The knowledge and the training base uh, just was not there on what concussions really were, what the symptoms of them were. Ultimately, we weren't looking for them. Morgantown, West Virginia, March 13, 2015. It's West Virginia University Pro Day. The Mountaineer stars align. Kevin White, Mario Alford, and one name everyone in the Mountain State knows. One, one, two, four, boom, oh, wow. Clint Trickett. So just one step, four to the slant, and then back out. They asked me to do it, so I'm just going to come back and do it for these guys, and that, that just shows you how much of a bond we had. He was born and raised in Morgantown. After his freshman year of high school, Trickett moved to Tallahassee, Florida, where he graduated from North Florida Christian. Trickett began his collegiate career at Florida State and was Bobby Bowden's last recruit. He comes from a family with deep-rooted football traditions. His father, Rick, a Vietnam veteran, has coached across the United States. My dad, obviously, is one of the most respected offensive line coaches in the country. Uh, he's been everywhere, uh, Mississippi State, Auburn, LSU, West Virginia, and now Florida State since I've been alive. There's obviously that Marine military aspect to him, and he takes that on to field coaching. He's very discipline-oriented. Meanwhile, the eldest Trickett sibling, Travis, is the offensive coordinator at Samford, and the middle son, Chance, is the recruiting coordinator at Louisiana Tech. We're a football family. It's, uh, it's in our blood, and we, uh, you know, we, we take pride in it. So why is Trickett not officially participating as a senior in West Virginia's Pro Day? Concussion is uh, obviously the, the, the very apex of what everybody talks about these days. There is a struggle with what a definition is. However, it does is being defined as a disruption to normal brain function. Dave Kearns has been at West Virginia University for 21 years. In total, he's been in the profession 32 years, 29 of them as a certified athletic trainer. While Kearns worked with Trickett throughout his playing days at WVU, he also had prior dealings with the Trickett family. I was here when his dad, Rick Trick, had coached here, so I had knowledge of Clint when he was, I'm not even sure the age, 8, 9, 10, 12, whatever. Sure, the bringings up and the brothers, and you know, I, I can remember numerous uh, requests by Rick, the father, to look at one of the sons because the other son did this, did that, you know, tough, tough love type stuff. Very testosterone dominated house. You know, I feel bad for my mom. She's the sweetest woman on the planet and has to deal with my dad, who's just, that's hard to deal with himself, but then you have three boys, you know, who are all just, you know, 
always fighting. He is a headstrong individual, which is good. He's a competitor, which is good. But when it comes to us finding out questions, there wasn't always the truthfulness that we would like to see. It was Kansas State my junior year. And I didn't tell anyone about it, just kept playing through it. Still at that time, you know, I, I had been named the starter, but I was still in sort of a competition with two other quarterbacks. And so you're never going to, you know, even if you are the starter, bar none, you're not going to take yourself out, especially if you're in a competition. Texas was my next one, and that was my junior year. And that one I was actually knocked out. After the second one, which was a loss of consciousness, he did come forward with other signs and symptoms for which he had denied previously that did indeed tell us that the first one did exist. For me, it really picked up after the Texas concussion. Went up to UPMC in Pittsburgh, and uh, they, they are the forefront, you know, in concussions up there. They did the impact tests, you know, they're, they're in charge of a lot of things, and they explained everything to me, and I didn't know all that goes into it, and that's when I really got educated from it. Blue ready, it's a hit. We have it on paper and follow it, four stage return. Uh, must be signed symptom free for 24 hours and then begin some light aerobic activity. Let 24 hours pass, remain signed symptom free, then progress to more challenging cardiovascular strenuousness. Let 24 hours pass. If they're signed symptom free, they participate in a non-contact practice. Next stage would be full return to practice and then a full return to game. Third one was Maryland this year. Um, it was actually on the first drive of the game and it ended up being best game of the year for me in our offense. So I couldn't see out of the left half of my left eye. I mean, black. It was weird. And then like it faded into fuzz and then was like semi-okay on the right side. I remember coming back the next day watching film and not remembering a lot of things that had happened and a lot of plays that I made. And that was actually kind of cool, if I, you know, to be honest, I thought it was kind of cool. You can have visual changes due to ocular trauma, eye trauma, or getting hit, that type of thing too. Fourth one, which was a, a minor one, was TCU this past year was, uh, and I didn't even think it was. It was a, a play where I was running and it was a face mask actually didn't get called. I ripped my head back, hit the ground. I didn't realize I did this until I watched film the next day. I tried getting up after it and I fell three times. I don't even remember that. The brain could get concussed one area or another and that could spark either more of a headache, longer lasting a headache, or memory issues or balance issues or whatever the case may be. Just depends on what area is affected. Kansas State this year, it was senior night. Threw a pick right before halftime and uh, made the tackle and they actually didn't get any points so it was all good. Uh, but when I made the tackle, I. I just launched at it. There's no way I should have made this tackle either. His knee hit the side of my head, was way out of it. Um, didn't tell anyone, went into halftime. I actually threw up a couple times in there, just, you know, tried to just get as normal as I could. Came out the second half, still was woozy, was seeing just all, I was dazed and confused. And then finally the trainer like came up and talked to me about something else, realized something was wrong, pulled me out, and then never got to play again, but that's just how it is. On December 26, 2014, Trickett retired from the game of football. came out like it was my idea, but it was kind of a you know forced decision. I, you know, the doctors told me, you know, you're probably not going to be able to play again. You've suffered some severe you know, concussions. It was uh, five and 14 months. We hadn't even begun to go down the road of return to play because he was still symptomatic. The last one was probably the most severe one, and then when we talked to the doctors and we did our test scores and my eyes at that time before the, the concussion were at 97 percent um, and then after that one they were at 36 which is obviously a dramatic drop off. That was kind of the big warning sign you know like hey we gotta, we gotta stop. He was seen I think three times by an outside source even that third time which was December 18th, 19th somewhere around that time. He still hadn't begun day one return to play for us because of signs and symptoms, disrupted sleep patterns and getting dizzy with exercise, the little bit that he was doing, which was far decreased from what a, a normal athlete would per, uh, pertain with. Even the same individual with recurrent concussion uh, can, can present in, in a different fashion. While extensive research is being conducted at the collegiate level, injury awareness and prevention is growing across football as a whole especially the youth level. 
in Norman, Oklahoma, tackle football does not begin until the fourth grade. That was one of the big things going into the season was most of these boys haven't played before. And so breaking down the, the fundamentals for them in all aspects of it. And with tackling being the biggest, that's honestly where we spent exclusively the first couple of practices and, and re continue to reinforce throughout the year. Darren Six Killer is a campus minister at the University of Oklahoma through Alameda Church of Christ. His youngest son, Camden, will begin the fifth grade come fall. Darren coaches Camden's team, which is part of a league sponsored by the Norman Optimist Club. Last season was the first for tackle, with Cam playing quarterback and linebacker. Prior to that, it was a little different for Cam and his teammates. That's not really football, not as much as this. Yeah. Flag football, good job, you caught a flag on someone's waist. It's not really important. When Cam was four years old, playing in the backyard with his brother Kalen one summer day, an accident left his athletic future and quality of life in jeopardy. My oldest came running in saying, I killed Camden, I killed Camden. He thought that that he had. Basically what happened is he, he swung the golf club and Camden walked behind him and the toe of the club hit Camden right on the forehead there and caused a skull fracture. They put a plate, a titanium plate, in his head that he still has. One of the first things he, he was most concerned about was whether or not he could play football as a four-year-old. And that, so that speaks to how much he loves football and, and has loved it for a long time. He's definitely headstrong. We call him the mule. He'll stick his nose in there and and go after, and didn't matter how big the runner was or the block or anything, he was gonna go. Properly tackle people so you don't injure them or yourself. Just how to do stuff right without getting hurt. Our deal has always been you need to be active and doing something. And being a part of a team too is a big thing that you can't get in a lot of other areas of life. Dr. Larry Mullins has been a professor of psychology at Oklahoma State University since 1995 and is also the director of clinical training. His two youngest sons, Carson and Kiefer, are the same age as Kalen and Cam Sixkiller, 13 and 10, and began playing football around third grade. One of the things we noticed with Carson when he was playing flag football, one of the first times he got out on the field, and you know, take into account this is a kid very quiet, uh, a little bit introverted, but a smart kid. He got out on the tee ball field and the first time he made a tackle, he wrestled the kid to the ground and ripped his flags off. Throughout that first season, continually made tackles and evidenced no fear no whatsoever, which was in, in a sense shocking to his mom and I, because we had not seen that, that, that side of him. Just as Darren teaches his youth team fundamental techniques of the game to avoid injury, Dr. Mullins has witnessed a more proactive approach to handling injuries. From what I've seen, especially at the grade school level, but even at the junior high level, is that it's improved dramatically. You see people over there immediately paying attention, going through the protocol, and taking their helmet away if they need to. People have speculated that the youth football athlete might be a little more susceptible. Uh, to long-term changes, um, but again, no, I haven't seen any solid data on it. We show an education piece at the beginning of the year that helps educate not only our coaches, but also our players about concussion, symptoms of concussion. One of Brown's players at Little Elm is junior wide receiver Brian Byram. He moved from his hometown of Harlingen, Texas, to live with relatives in Dallas, just to possibly get a chance to get noticed by college scouts. However, it hasn't come without bumps in the road starting last fall. First concussion, I was playing corner, and I was, as I was going up, I caught the ball, but I was like leaned backwards, kinda, and my head just slammed. Got up, it was a little fuzzy, didn't really know what was going on. Went to the sideline and played the rest of the practice. Had to fill out a concussion chart. Had to wear sunglasses throughout the day sometimes. You saw there the frustration of a kid that wanted to get back out on the field quickly, but then he was still having symptoms. A few weeks later, we were going snowboarding in Colorado. It wasn't really powdery. And I went to break on my board, and my board just caught in the snow, and I just 
and just went hit, started rolling and got up and this was this was worse than the first time. Distorted, didn't know what was going on, just saw white. Worst headache I've ever had in my life. I look at my phone and I couldn't read. We have a system, it's called the Head Impact Telemetry System. It measures um, how fast the head is moving after an impact. In real time, we can track every impact, uh, location, and magnitude that every player on the team gets during the year. It was kind of our first step into the high school world. While concussion as an injury is difficult to deal with, there remains an unrelenting conflict in its progression, the lack of disclosure by an athlete. I'd probably play the game out honestly, and just keep going. Even if you're out a day, you'll drop down on the leaderboards. We live in a culture of sports that penalizes those who are hurt. To the extent that a, that a player divulges that they're indeed injured, they get pulled, and when you don't play, you don't move forward. There wasn't much discussion or any that I can remember on concussion. You know, I've been dinged and, you know, knocked out, you know, once before and just many times been woozy, but I never reported anything like that. Especially in the quarterback position, you're looked at as the leader, you're never going to pull yourself out of the game. If you have signs and symptoms, you need to relay those so they can be properly evaluated, properly cared for, and properly returned. Short-term effects are well established, but continually defined. Any discussions concerning long-term effects of concussions are tentative because of the need to develop a more definitive understanding. We really don't know at this point in time. What we have gained an appreciation for recently is, is that there is some short, uh, obviously some short-term impact uh, and effect to the brain. And, and we have to assume that, uh, that there is some long-term to that as well. We can't show where the number of impacts leading up to the concussion influences your risk. We cannot show that the magnitude of the injury predicts how severe the outcome will be. Uh, and we're not exactly sure why that is. Moves have been made for the safety of the game. From the $765 million lawsuit between the NFL and retired players for injury settlements, to the Illinois legislature passing a bill requiring youth football coaches to get concussion training. It's about understanding the risk of a high contact sport and learning to play the game properly. I think most of them have that embedded in them when they're young, that they realize that it is a contact sport, it is a violent game by nature. Try to educate and you hope that the individuals, the athletes are making wise decisions. We've become better educated in regards to knowing how to deal with a concussion and using the proper steps to make sure that our, our athletes get back on the field safe. Even with all the hype, a greater appreciation and understanding of concussion evolves every day. While Gove used to play at OU, he is now looking to develop the way of the future with Unequal Technologies, a firm specializing in athletic safety equipment. We started off as a military-focused company uh, working with Kevlar composite padding, uh, where Kevlar was an ingredient uh, when combined with our Acceleron uh, proprietary foam materials. What it's allowed us to do is take traditional padding and exponentially get that much more shock suppression, g-force reduction out of it, um, and overall acceleration reduction out of it. Because that's the goal anytime that a body's taking an impact is reduce the acceleration, reduce the peak g-forces, which causes injury. The future is bright based on evolving technology and studies. In three years, Unequal has went from working with four high schools to thousands across the country. And the NCAA study while beginning year two, has major goals for extended research. It's a Kevlar liner that drops right into the pad. It's called the gyro, and it's a freestanding pad that literally can drop in any helmet for football on the market, not adhere to it, not attach to it, and be a freestanding piece while still keeping the helmet functional uh, without having to take anything out. We've been independently tested and accredited at iOS laboratories. Everything we do has been tested to reduce severity index up to 50%. Reducing the severity index obviously lowers the risk of injury. Our big goal is to do a longitudinal study. So all the athletes that we're enrolling now, or at least within the first three years, we're estimating about 25,000. We're hoping that we can track them 
um, for 10 years after they get out of school, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. So it really make it a long-term study on how concussion affects neurological function. Cam and Brian are the next generation of hopeful football stars, a generation that will see many advancements in the safety of the game. I make the NFL if I can. Good. I work hard enough. Just do your best in everything you do and try your hardest. I'm going to go as far as I can, but I'm not just going to, I mean, I'm going to have a backup plan, you know, but I'm just going to do what I can do. For any athlete, there is life beyond their sport. Everyone's plussed over here. Everyone's plussed over here. For Trickett, his playing days may be over, but he still remains close to the game he loves. Middle of field safety. He was named quarterbacks coach at East Mississippi Community College in March. I'm completely moved on um, and I get my little football you know, fill each day when I warm up with the guys and I have to go out there and throw with them. And the, uh, the staff I'm with has been phenomenal. They've really just taken me in. It's we, we think he's kind of a shining star. We think he's a bright guy that's on the rise, no question about it. He looks at the game. He is a very mature young coach. Me having this job and still being around football and still being in it, it keeps that competitive spirit alive. I'm still interacting and I'm still doing the game that I love. I'm not the ex-quarterback, I'm their quarterback coach. Bring it up, bring it up, bring it up. 